All right, today's video lesson is on Hess's law. Um, what Hess did was he was able to use these thermochemical equations um, and found a way that we can manipulate them so we don't always have to carry out um, the, the actual chemical reaction in order to determine the changes in enthalpy. All right, so in order to do this, what we have to do is we have to under understand something about thermochemical equations and what we can do with them. So we're going to look at how we use our thermochemical equations. All right, um, so the idea here is that we, we want to find a way to calculate changes in enthalpy. Okay, we want to know how do you figure out what this value is. Now you could do calorimeter and you can actually figure it out, but you have to carry out the reaction and get experimental data. Now this way we're going to look at what's called Hess's law. All right, so the first thing we're going to understand about thermochemical equations is that they are extensive properties. I know we haven't really talked about this much, but the idea behind an extensive property is that it depends on how much you have. So this property, enthalpy, so the enthalpy of the system depends on how much material you have. The more you have, the more enthalpy change is going to occur. So the magnitude of this change in enthalpy is proportional to the amount of reactant consumed. So think about it. If you have um, a little bit of fuel and you react it, you get a little bit of energy. You have a lot of fuel, you get a lot of energy. So if you double the reaction, meaning you double the amount of reactants you have, you're going to double the change in enthalpy. If you cut it in half the reaction, then you cut the changes in enthalpy in half. Okay, so it's pretty makes kind of sense there if you think about it, right? The, you, you, the more you have, the more energy you get out, okay? All right, so the next thing we want to look at is um, what happens when we reverse reactions. Now, this isn't necessarily mean that the reaction is going to happen in the reverse process. It's just saying what would happen if we could reverse it. So what matters is the beginning process and the final process. So we know that we start with methane and oxygen and we produce carbon dioxide and water, but how do we do that? Well, it doesn't really matter how we do it as long as what we do is we get carbon dioxide and water out of the reaction system. Uh, it'll make more sense when we look at some other some examples in a minute. Um, so for, for this process, we're just saying if I have this reaction, it's going to produce 890 kilojoules of energy. That's how much energy comes out. It's exothermic. But what if I were to reverse it? What if I took carbon dioxide and water and reversed it? Well, in order to get that process to happen, I have to add 890 kilojoules of energy, right? If this is the amount of energy it gives off, this is the amount of energy it needs to go back in the opposite direction, okay? So does that mean that we can take carbon dioxide and water and make methane and oxygen? Well, not really, okay? That, that doesn't necessarily mean that this process can happen. It's just saying what would the change in enthalpy be? So for now, just worry about this. If you reverse the process, reverse the sign notation. Don't, don't give it too much thought right now. Um, we'll, I'll try to answer it as we go through more stuff in class. All right, the other one is, and this isn't used as often as the first two uh, fu uh, functions of thermochemical equations, uh, but the states of matter are really important. Okay, so if I produce methane, or if I react methane and I produce water as a liquid, well, I get neg negative, well, I get 890 kilojoules of energy to come out of the system. Okay, but if I were to do this and I allow it to turn into a gas, I'm not going to get as much energy out because some of that energy has to go into the liquid to convert it to the gas phase. So therefore, the end result is that less energy comes out because more energy is stored in that gas phase. So the enthalpy of the system is going to be higher and therefore the change in enthalpy would be lower because I, I don't have as much energy coming out, more of it staying in the system to keep it as a gas than it is to let it cool and condense to a liquid. So the point here is that watch the states of matter. It doesn't come up too often, but when we go from a liquid to a gas, there's the changes in enthalpy are required. This is called the heat of vaporization. We'll look at that a little bit more depth a little bit later, but for now, if we go from a liquid to a gas, we are going to add 88 kilojoules. And remember, if I reverse that, if I go from liquid the gas to the liquid, I would just reverse the sign notation. Okay? So that's pretty much it. Those are the three thermochemical equations. You now have everything you need to know in order to understand Hess's law. So what we find is that we can get these results from a reaction, right? We can we can figure out what the changes in enthalpy are. What scientists have done is they've tabulated these results. So there's charts that have changes in enthalpy for particular reactions. Now because enthalpy is a state function, we're not concerned with the process of how it gets to the products. We're just concerned with how it goes from reactants. We're just concerned that we start with our reactants and we end with our products. The net result between the two is what's important. So the pathway has no effect. Okay, So Hess basically thought, found that if you can sum up a bunch of different steps together and they add up to the overall reaction, then you can get 
the uh, uh, changes in enthalpy.